We are Life Church Livonia. All right, good morning, Life Church. So apparently, this is a topic that you guys actually did want to talk about, right? We are going to start our sermon off today a little differently than we normally do. And I'm going to ask you to uh, work with me here a little bit. And we're going to um, watch a couple of videos here. And you have a job to do. Besides just watching the video, uh, I want you to help me uh, by using your observation skills. And the video that I'm going to show you is a, a whodunit video in, in classic like English theater style. And so you, we're going to show you a whodunit video. I want you to pay really close attention to the video uh, and observe uh, the whole thing. And then we're going to talk about it afterwards. It's very brief. So uh, check out this video. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? How observant were you? Here's the, here's the question. Did you see all 21 changes that happened in the video? 21 changes in the video. Did you see any of them? Some of you are like, changes? I have no idea what you're even talking about. Changes? There were changes in the video? And, and, and so the, I asked you to be observant, and then you didn't even notice the changes. And so I want to give you a second opportunity. We're going to watch the, the same video Again, and I want you to see how many changes you can observe this time. Roll the video. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? All right, how many did you get that time? Did anyone get more than five? Raise your hand if you got more than five. I see a couple of hands. Raise your hand if you got more than ten. It's hard, isn't it? So some of you are sitting here thinking, there wasn't 21. He made that up. There's no way there were 21. So I'm going to show it to you one more time from a, <laughs> listen, from a different angle. It's going to wreck your mind, okay? Uh, one more time from a different camera angle, the exact same scene. Ready? One more time. And uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. I'll tell you the one that got me. I had no idea the dead guy was different. <laughs> you never even noticed it, right? 
And so Ron noticed it. You win a prize, a free cup of coffee for, for you, and a donut too if you want one. Here, here's, the, here's the truth, and this is why we started here today. It's, so, it's a very unusual way to start a sermon, but uh, I wanted to, to help you to understand that none of us are as observant as we think we are. None of us are as observant as we think we are. And it's true for, for videos like the one that, that we just saw, but it's even more true about events in your life. It's even more true about circumstances in your own relationships. It's, it's absolutely true about, about your, your spiritual journey with Jesus. It's true about every aspect of who you are that none of us are as observant as we think we are. And one of the hallmarks of who we are here at Life Church Livonia is that we say we want to be real people, meeting a real God, living real life. And the question is, how can we be real if what we're observing isn't reality? Or what we think we're seeing, or we, who we think we are isn't based on reality. How can we begin to know God deeply if we don't know ourselves first? Pete Scazzaro says this. He says, most Christians, I am afraid, are self-conscious but not self-aware. Think about this. Most Christians, I'm afraid, he says, are self-conscious but not self-aware. And the problem is this. Self-consciousness without self-awareness leads to shame. And shame without the grace of God, where it meets God's grace and God's love and God's forgiveness, leads to us hiding from the truth rather than us running towards the truth. And one of the things I want us to think about as we start into this brand new series today is how would your life change how would my life change? How would all of our lives change if we decided we, wanted, we were going to make a decision to move from being just self-conscious to beginning to move into self-awareness, to begin to, to move towards the truth instead of hiding from the truth? What if we began to ask God to help us discover the places in our life where we had major blind spots? Spaces in our, in our life that we just don't see, we don't recognize. We are completely oblivious to their, even the, them even existing in our life. If you knew you had a major blind spot in your life, the question is, would you want to know? And most of you say, you, 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 your initial reaction would be, well, of course. And then you start to think about it, and you're like, well, I don't know if I'd want to know. It depends on how big the blind spot is. It depends on how long it's been there for. It depends on how it's affected the people around me. But blind spots in our life have to be addressed or else we will never actually be able to uncover the real us and we'll have a difficult time finding the real God. For the purposes of what, what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks, we're going to use a definition of blind spot from a book written by uh, two guys, Riddle and Anderson. And they said, blind spots are anything that stands in the way of being all that God has intended for our lives. Blind spots are anything that stand in the way of being all that God intended for our lives. I believe that God has big plans for you. Big plans for you. There's so much to life that he wants to lead you into. And what we want to do is help you identify the blind spots that are preventing you from getting to those places. Sometimes blind spots are sinful. Sometimes they're, they're, they, they are downright evil, but other times they're, it's not sin. They're based in, in maybe ignorance, you just don't know, or they're based in immaturity, you haven't grown up to that spot yet. Uh, sometimes it's, they're based on circumstances, that you grew up in a certain context, in a certain culture, and you were taught things that just weren't true, and you don't know that you have a blind spot. But they're blind spots nonetheless. Regardless of their nature, they can create uh, pain in your life, they can create anxiety in your life. They can create a, a, a situation where you second guess yourself and you have relational trouble, where you have financial trouble. Blind spots can become a real problem regardless of whether they are sinful or not sinful. So they're so important to address because they can keep you from being all that God has made you to be. And not only that, but listen, this is so important. What you don't see can hurt you and others. 
I want you to think about this. What you don't see absolutely has the power to hurt you. And I promise you, it will at some point hurt others. And I think that every single one of us in this room can think of a situation where this is absolutely true. If I, if I sat down one-on-one with you and I said, think about a story, uh, a situation where someone's blind spots caused you pain. Or someone's blind spots created a conflict in your life. Or maybe even telling a story about yourself to say, uh, tell me a story about a time when your blind spots caused you pain or brokenness. What you don't see can hurt you and others. But the problem is that blind spots are by definition impossible or nearly impossible to see in your own life. But they're really easy to see in other people, aren't they? Really, really easy And some of you are probably even wondering to yourself, I don't think I have any blind spots. You might be thinking, well, I don't know. I think I'm pretty self-aware. I'm not certain I have any spaces that are like that that would would cause hurt or pain to myself or others. And if you think that you're that person that doesn't have any blind spots, I promise you, you are a person who has blind spots. Just ask the people who know you the closest. I dare you. In a context of safety... Set up a situation where you sit down with your spouse or your, or your siblings. Siblings are really good for speaking truth, by the way. They just don't care if they hurt your feelings because you know, you're stuck with them. Your parents, someone you know and trust to actually speak the truth to you and say, Do you see, are there any blind spots in my life? And I promise you they're going to reveal something to you. Something that is a weakness that's preventing you from being all that God longs for you to be. Unless you've done a lot of work towards self-awareness, I have a feeling you'd be surprised by that conversation. And even if you've done a lot of work towards self-awareness, you might still be surprised. The difficulty uh, lies here. That it's really easy to see other people's blind spots, but hard to see our own. And so what we find ourselves doing is spending a lot of time pointing out other people's blind spots and not looking at our own. We spend a whole lot of time uh, in our relationships thinking to ourselves, if, if, if she could just see what she's missing, she would be all these things that you want her to be. Or if he could just Uh, actually realize the way that he acts is causing this, everything would change, right? We spend a lot of time thinking about that. And and sometimes it gets stuck in our brain and runs on loop. We call that perseveration. And we get stuck in this spot, looking at other people's blind spots and thinking about how the world would be different and how our world would be different if they could just get that taken care of, but in the the midst of all of that, we forget to hold a mirror up and look at our own self. Jesus addresses this really clearly in Matthew chapter 7. He's teaching a group of people that have gathered around him, and in the midst of that teaching, he says this, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So he's saying, uh, don't, don't hold people accountable to a standard that you're unwilling to submit yourself to. So if you're saying to other people, you need to be aware of your blind spots, but you're not willing to look at your own, Jesus says, hold on. You're going to be judged by the measure you use to measure others. You're going to be held to the same standard that you hold others. But he goes on and he says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. In many translations, you, maybe if you grew up in the church, you heard this, you heard this verse uh, talk about logs. Instead of planks, there's a log in your eye. And it seems ludicrous, honestly. It seems like an over-the-top story where you're like, well, this is just a dumb story. Because no one would walk around with an entire board in their eye and not notice. Right? 
And you think to yourself, this story seems uh, absurd, but then we begin to overlay it on this concept of blind spots, and we realize, oh my gosh, it absolutely is true. We know people who have planks in their eye. We know people whose vision, their ability to see other people, their ability to see situations or to encounter different obstacles in their life are, is totally inhibited because there's something blocking their ability to see it the way it really is, or at least to see it the way you want them to see it. You know what it looks like when someone's vision is inhibited by a plank in their eye. And, and the truth is, is even as we watched that video at the beginning about, about how observant are you, there's, there's things we miss. And ultimately, we don't end up seeing the world as it is. We see the world as we want it to be. We don't always see the world as it is. We see the world through our personal lens, specs, planks included. And, and, and what I want you to see here is that as you ask yourself the question, how could a person walk through life not knowing that they had a huge log in their eye? Uh, what I want uh, to help you to understand that is think about a person who is colorblind but never knew that they were colorblind. And then one day they realize, oh, you mean I see things differently than you? I had a friend that, that didn't find out he was colorblind until he was uh, in his 30s when he decided to go get his pilot's license. It had been a dream of his, his life, whole life, to go and get his pilot's license. And uh, he saved up money and he got a good job. And he was like, now's the time I'm going to do this recreationally. And I'm going to go and I'm going to get my pilot's license. And he couldn't pass the tests because he couldn't see colors accurately. He had no idea in his 30s. You would think that people would have noticed by his outfits, Right? But everyone just thought he was eccentric, right? <laughs> there was a major issue with his vision that not only did he not know, but no one knew around him. Metaphorically, we look at this and we think, oh my gosh, that could happen in almost any situation. Not just with colorblindness, but in our relationships and the way we see people and the way that we do life. We do not see the world as it is. We see the world as we want it to be. And because of that, we have a tendency to miss areas in our own life that Jesus wants to bring under his authority. We have a tendency to miss out on these places where God wants to redeem us, where he wants to transform us, where he wants to, 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 to create healing in our life, to create wholeness in our life so that we then can help bring wholeness and healing to the people around us. But we can't do that. We can't be God's ambassador, God's agent in the world for transformation, for change, for reconciliation, unless we're able to identify our own brokenness first. I want you to pay attention here because in, in the final verse uh, here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 5, listen to what he says. He says, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. He never tells us that we shouldn't help people identify blind spots. He doesn't say to us, uh, you should just ignore the areas where people aren't seeing clearly. He doesn't say that. He says, until you deal with the blind spots in your life, you won't be able to help other people. You won't be able to walk alongside of people. Your entire view of the world will be skewed by the log that is sitting right in the middle of your field of view. Right in the middle of your field of view. Did you know that every single one of you have a blind spot? There's an area on your, uh, in your eye that actually can't see. And that's why it's, it's super important to have two eyes that can see. I, I have some serious issues with my eyes with corneal disease, and so this affects me at times. And, and what, what happens, there's all sorts of eye tests you can take where you, uh, at certain distances, if you, if you cover one eye and, and there's two images and you bring the, the page close enough, one of the images will disappear, and you know in that moment that your, the, the page has reached the spot where you have a blind spot. All of you have it. Every single one of you. And so the question becomes, why is it that you can see both of those images no matter how close the page is with two eyes open? Your brain fills in the gap. Your imagination 
fills in the gap. You literally see things that you aren't seeing. That's how complex your brain is. But we do the same things, not just with little images on a, on a piece of paper, but in our world. We create a story or a narrative about our life, around the things we believe to be true, and sometimes with a big blind spot in the middle of it. And we create this narrative. And what happens is that we tell ourselves stories, and then we pour our lives into the stories we tell. So we get super committed to our blind spots. Super committed to our way of viewing life. Super committed to our understanding about what reality is. This is why it's so hard to have a conversation about politics. Because we get so committed to the stories that we've told ourselves that we, we, we've committed. And we, we can't even see that there might be another way to view the situation. But here's the scary question. If we tell ourselves stories and then pour our, our lives into the stories you tell, what happens if the story you've been telling yourself isn't real? What happens if the story you've been telling yourself is based upon something that's not true? What if your story is skewed by a giant blind spot that everyone around you can see but you are completely oblivious to? Wouldn't you want to address that? Wouldn't you want to take care of that? If that's you, I think that, that if it's, or if it's me, what we need is a, a huge aha moment. We need an aha moment where suddenly we're like, what in the world? Why did no one tell me? How did I not know that I had this massive board sticking out of my eye? We need an aha moment. I had a major one during college. A huge aha moment that was, it was kind of building in my life all the way from probably middle school. You see, when I was in middle school, I lived with a huge amount of self-doubt, a huge amount of insecurity. I'm not even sure where that came from. We'll deal with that in counseling another time. But I had all this insecurity and, and social awkwardness. Oh my goodness, was I awkward. Imagine uh, uh, an acne-laden, awkward middle schooler, me, right here. You got a picture of what I looked like in, high, in, in middle school, and, then, and it continued kind of into some of my young high school years, and it all changed my junior year when uh, this, this really uh, incredible young woman named Megan became my friends, and we, weren't, we didn't date. It wasn't girlfriend-boyfriend. We just were friends, and she was really cool and super popular and totally not socially awkward, and she took me under her wing and kind of brought me into her social circle, but I was not ready for it. <laughs> And what happened in that, in that stage of my life is that my ego outpaced my popularity. I went from this insecure guy to this overcompensating guy, right? From this insecure uh, guy crippled by self-doubt to this guy that still had the self-doubt but masked it really, really well by uh, having a huge uh, external kind of ego. And the truth was is that I really wasn't very fun to be around sometimes. If you've ever been around someone that had a massive ego, kind of this arrogant jerk, I was the poster child for that. And I carried that with me into college. I had no idea, honestly, that I was like this. No clue. It was a major blind spot in my life. I just thought that's how you had to act to be accepted, to be uh, invited to be welcomed in, and so that's just what I did. It all kind of came to a head when I was in college, and I went to a gathering of all my friends, uh, all my friends one night, and we were hanging out at someone's apartment. I don't even re remember where we were, but we had, we had had to carpool to get there. And a bunch of my closest friends, including my roommate, were standing out on the balcony and, uh, of this apartment, hanging out. And I opened the, the balcony door and stepped out, and I stepped out right into the middle of them talking about me. It was really clear they'd been talking about me. You know that moment when everyone gets super awkward, and they're like, oh, they don't know what to do with their hands even, you know? And so I said, I said, well, what were you guys talking about? And in that moment, most of the time, people just lie. They don't want to tell you the truth. But my roommate was um, kind of done. 
He was just done. And so he was super bold. And this is what he said to me. He said, I'll tell you what we were talking about. We're talking about how you are an arrogant jerk and we were arguing about which one of us had to take you home. So I just need a hug right now. Someone's coming. <laughs> wow, right? Like that's hardcore. And it was true. It was true. I was initially kind of angry. Like, what the heck, guys? Like, that's mean. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized this is a blind spot, and I had no idea. I had no idea that, but it explained so many things that I had been wrestling with and so many broken relationships that I had seen happen over and over again in my life. So this was an aha moment for me. That took years to resolve because I tried to fix it through behavior modification. I just tried to change how I acted. But the problem was is I, I tried to change how I acted without allowing God to change my heart. Because at that point, I wasn't really following God. I didn't want to partner with God to create transformation internally. I just wanted to change my circumstances so that people didn't view me in that same way. And it was really tough. And honestly, it wasn't until years later when I, when I kind of brought that, that issue under the authority of Jesus. And I asked him to heal me and to change me. That the real transformation began to take place. That was an aha moment that got dropped in my lap. And it wasn't fun at all. But I want to, I want to read a quote to you from Tim Riddle about aha moments. I think it was really good and really helpful. He says, you can discover the aha moment or the aha moment can discover you. The first is enlightening and manageable followed by growth. The second still provides an opportunity for growth but is more painful. That is the understatement of the century. I want you to think about this again. Think about this, this quote that you can discover the aha moment or the aha moment can discover you. Both can be catalysts for growth. Both can be catalysts to change, but the one is super painful. Both will probably be a little painful, but, but if you go seeking the aha moment, if, you go, if you're longing for transformation, if you're longing to have these blind spots revealed in your life and you discover them, even though it's hard, it's so much more manageable than if they get dropped in your lap out of the blue. And so often when, when aha moments get dropped in your lap in the midst of an argument maybe with, with a friend or a family member or in the midst of conflict in some way that get dropped in your life, uh, we either uh, dig our heels in and argue that, no, I don't have a log in my eye. What are you talking about? You're the one with a log in your eye. We get defensive and we dig our heels in and we back up. And instead of growing or changing out of that, we actually become more entrenched in the story that we've told ourselves about our life. More committed to our false reality, our, more, our false understanding of who we are. It happens often when aha moments get dropped in our lap. And even though growth can happen as a result of those moments, transformation that comes from seeking out our aha moments is so much better it's more gentle. It's more transformative. It's more helpful in the long term to who you are. And it's more uh, helpful in terms of assisting you to change the narrative you've been telling yourself about your story. The beautiful thing about this is, is that God wants to walk alongside of you. The same person, Jesus, who sat there that day and taught his disciples about planks and specks and about uh, the standard by which you judge others will be used to judge you. The same God who gave them those, those warnings is also willing to walk alongside of you. Nobody is better at creating aha moments than God. Nobody is better at creating aha moments than God. He's the master at it. And sometimes he does this in our life, even if we're not seeking it out. 
But he'll do it in your life if you ask him to help you. He works through his Holy Spirit speaking inside of you. Sometimes the aha aha moments come in prayer. You're on your knees praying, and you're praying with a friend, or you're praying in a small group, or you're back in the corner praying with our prayer team, and suddenly God awakens something in you. You have an aha moment. The Holy Spirit spoke that to you. Sometimes we have an aha moment as we're, as we're digging into his word, as we're studying the Bible, and we read a passage, and we, we realize, oh my goodness, that's me. I see myself here in this space. Sometimes it comes through God's people, gently pointing out areas, lovingly revealing your blind spots. We have a Savior who will not only help you to identify your blind spots, but will forgive you of any of the harm that you've created in your life or the lives of the people around you as a result of it. We have a Savior who will not only identify your blind spots, but will forgive you the sin caused by them. We have a God who will empower you to remove the log from your eye. Not just so you can be free of it, although that that is huge, but so then you can be used by him more fully to live completely into who he called you to be. What you don't see can hurt you and others, but it doesn't have to stay that way. What you don't see can hurt you and others, but it doesn't have to be your story for the rest of your life. Your story can change with the help of God. He can begin to help you to live into a brand new life narrative. You can begin to tell a different story about your life and then live into that story. We talked about that earlier, how people tell stories about their lives and and then they, they, they pour their lives into the stories that they tell. What if you decided to pour your life into a different story? What if you decided to pour your life into a story that wasn't written by you, but a story that was written by God? What would happen then? How would that transform your world? Jesus talks about that in John chapter eight and, he, and he's saying, I want you to dig into my story. I want you to pour yourself into who I am and who I'm calling you to be. I want you to to follow me as my disciple and dive into the truth there. And something beautiful will happen if you do. Listen to what he says. He says, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. That's pouring yourself into his, his story. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Aha moments are truth moments. Aha moments are truth encounters that are hard to hear and painful to receive, but can lead towards transformation or can lead towards destruction, depending on which way you run. People who are self-conscious but not self-aware will will hide from the truth, but people who long for self-awareness will run towards it. And Jesus says, I want you to run towards me. I want you to follow me. He says, I want you to take my hand and walk with me. Allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to you the spaces in your life where you're blind. Allow God's word to mold you and transform you into a story that is so much more beautiful than anything you could ever have written on your life. Allow God's people around you to speak life and hope and truth into you. When my roommate said that to me that night, He said it because he was angry. He said it because he was fed up and frustrated. When your boss or your coworkers or someone around you at your job uh, speak uh, truth into you and and say you have a blind spot, they call it out because they want you to be more productive or they they simply want a more peaceful work environment or or, or honestly, sometimes people reveal your blind spots to you because they're tired of the way that your broken story is messing up their story. They want you to write a new chapter in, their, in your life. When Jesus reveals truth to you, he does it to set you free. That's his agenda. Freedom, life, and life to the full. Abundance, mercy, grace, hope. When Jesus creates aha moments, he does it for your best interest. He does it to grow you and change you and transform you. 
Jesus is the best blind spot revealer that you will ever meet because he can actually help you to do something with it afterwards. He says, dive into the truth of my story and you'll find yours there. You won't just find the story about God, you'll find your story there. You'll find your true selves there and you will begin to experience transformation there. Friends, we don't all have uh, we, we all have blind spots, but we don't all address them. We all have blind spots, but we don't all learn from them. We all have blind spots, but we don't all long to have God reveal them to us so that we can be transformed. And the question I want you to wrestle with today is this. What if you were brave enough to seek out and address your blind spots? What if you were brave enough to seek out and address your blind spots? What if you made a decision today to begin seeking the truth about yourself? And then through the work of the Holy Spirit and and the truth found in God's word and the wisdom of the faithful around you, you were transformed. One of the things that we're going to be talking about uh, over the next few weeks uh, are life groups here. Opportunities for you to be in community. I want to tell you that, that God made us for community. And one of the best places to flesh out blind spots and to experience transformation is in the context of a small group. A small group of trusted individuals who are also on a journey towards Jesus. A small group of individuals who can help you to see yourself clearly. Who you can trust to to come to you and faithfully and gently address things with you. A small group of people that are in the process of having eye surgery to remove their logs. So they can help you with theirs. Sarah's going to talk about that a little bit more during the announcement time. But I can't encourage you enough to be a part of that as we launch those soon. What if you were brave enough to seek out and address your blind spots, to seek the Holy Spirit, to seek God's word, to seek the wisdom of faithful counsel? I believe things would change. And I believe that for some of you, there's going to be an aha moment today That even in the moment when we bow our heads and we start to pray, if you were brave enough to say to God, reveal to me the blind spots that are happening in my life, that he would bring to mind things right now. It's going to be hard, but there's going to be hope. We have a prayer team in the back. They are always there. Incredible, faithful, wise people. They've they've gone through eye surgery. (laughs) They might have to go through it again and again because there's layers to this but they want to walk alongside of you. I encourage you to go and allow them to pray with you and for you. The final thing I want to say to you is that we're not done. We're not done with this conversation. We're going to continue this conversation over the next four weeks. And what we're going to do is we're going to dive into very specific spaces in your life and in my life where blind spots tend to nest because they, there's like certain areas of our life where it's, you know, if you go hunting for rattlesnakes in the winter, there's certain places they go to, 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 to live all at once. You can find whole colonies of them. Guess what? Blind spots have places they nest in your life where they gather. The four areas we're going to look at, and we can look at a lot, but these are the four we've chosen. The first are spiritual, religious blind spots. Areas of your life that have to do with your walk with God or your experience of church. Second is financial and material blind spots. Things that have to do with the stuff you own or the stuff that owns you. Relational and emotional blind spots, the way you interact with the people around you, the way you view yourself. And finally, cultural, racial blind spots. They're huge. And I promise you that that all of you will have at least one blind spot in at least one of these areas. And we love you. You are welcome here. Real people, real God, real life. We don't say, get your act together and come to church. We say, come to church and let's meet Jesus so he can heal us. And we can get our act together 
together. And I also promise you that at some point, you're going to feel offended. I promise you, you're going to be offended at some point. And what I'll say to you is the moment you feel offended is the moment that the Lord has just touched a blind spot. The moment you feel frustrated at me is probably the moment that God's saying, he's saying, hello, this is your moment. This is your aha. Don't run. Dive in. Don't hide from the truth. Lean into the truth because the truth will set you free. Would you pray with me? So Jesus, we come to you in this space today. Some of us already deeply aware of our blind spots. Some of us already struggling with shame, struggling with fear, struggling with frustration, struggling with the pain that's been caused by other people's blind spots, God. And so God, today we just choose to bring that all to you. For those who have been wounded by other people's blind spots, we ask, God, that you would help us to forgive. That you would heal those those wounded places in us and that you would uh, help us to forgive the people that have caused the pain. For those of us who are the pain bringers, God, we ask that you would redeem us. We are so sorry for the way we've hurt other people. We ask that you would continue to create a new story in our lives and that it would be your story told through us. If you're here today and you're praying right now and you are feeling really far from God and you've begun to realize that your blind spot has to do with how you view life and how you view God, you know you are in desperate need of transformation, I just invite you right now to just open your heart and open your mind, open your life to God. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me for the way that my blind spots have kept me from you. Forgive me for the way that I've tried to do all of this on my own. Now, God, I ask that you would make me your child. You would draw me into your arms. You would make your story my story. We pray these things in the power and the name of Jesus. Amen.